Hopefully you're all having a great time at Cloud Next. Amazing. Welcome to our session on achieving digital sovereignty with Google Workspace. When we were thinking through this session, we decided to make a key strategic decision. We decided to organize the speakers in the ascending order of how good they are. Very good morning to all of you. I'm your first speaker, Ganesh, Director of Product at Google Workspace. I will be joined in a bit by three eminent speakers from our marquee customers to share their perspectives on their sovereignty journey with all of you. And we'll save time for Q&A at the end, and we're happy to interact with all of you after the session as well. So with that, let's get started. Let's begin by talking about digital sovereignty. It's a journey that we've been on over many years, been working with many customers and partners of ours as we kind of think through the notions of sovereignty and compliance. Organizations around the world care deeply about this subject because they're keen on ensuring that they're engaging their respective customers and stakeholders with trust. They obviously want to avoid compliance penalties. And most importantly, they want to enable their workforce and empower them with the best-in-class tools and do all of that in a sovereign and compliant manner. Now, when you think about the notions of sovereignty and compliance around the whole world, it can get pretty mind-bogglingly crazy because of the number of three-letter and four-letter acronyms around compliance. I myself can't remember each and every one of them and what they actually mean. But the great piece here is as we worked with several governments, regulators, customers, and organizations around the world, we've really distilled a lot of those compliance regulations down to three key capabilities that really matter. The first is authority. And this is really organizations wanting to ensure that they have unhindered access to their data on their terms. The second is confidentiality. And this is about organizations ensuring that they're in control and they prevent unauthorized foreign access to their data. And the third is privacy and security. Needless to say, organizations all around the world want to keep their data stored in a persistently private and secure fashion. Now, what's been interesting is when you think of these three key underlying needs for digital sovereignty, there's been this meme of data location being the panacea that solves it all. And what's interesting about it is data location really is inadequate. And the reason I say this is when we engage on a journey of deeply evaluating the tech stack that customers are on, especially with legacy cloud providers, they're surprised often to discover key gaps in data location that severely compromise their sovereignty posture. Let me walk through a few of those key gaps. First, let's start with the notion of international travel. How many of you here are at Cloud Next from outside the US? How many of you have traveled here from outside the US by a show of hands? Fantastic, there's quite a few of you that have come here. Thank you for making the long trip around. We hope you're having a great time. What we've realized is a lot of you who travel around the world, especially when you use a legacy cloud provider, you're, and you're really using a thick client on your laptop in order to access your cloud software. And once you access things through a thick client on your laptop instead of a browser, because the browser lacks full functionality for legacy cloud providers, what you have on your device is a cache of the critical information that you're working on. And that cache travels with you and your laptop wherever you go. So what that means is your data is here today with us in Moscone. The second scenario is that of mobile devices. I'm gonna do a quick audience poll again. How many of you use a Android phone by a show of hands? Okay, that's a fair number of you. How many of you use an iOS phone? 
fantastic. How many of you use a Windows phone? Checking, just checking for completeness. What do you think happens when you get a notification on your device about that sensitive email or about the chat message? Let me tell you, a whole copy of your data goes over to a mobile notification server that is owned by the companies that manufacture your device. What that means is there's a copy data located wherever you are, but there's a copy going out of the span of control of your legacy cloud provider to another company that owns the OS of your device. The third is foreign government access. And we all know that foreign government access is not predicated upon the location of data and happens regardless of the location of data. And the fourth, most importantly, is we're at a pretty critical juncture today where legacy cloud providers are seeing a spate of vulnerabilities that are exploited. The statistics speak for themselves. If you take a look at the CISA database for known exploited vulnerabilities in the wild over the past few years, there's a dozen of them, dozens of them actually, that exist, that have been exploited, and a lot of customers are facing breaches today. And all of that essentially originates because of the legacy infrastructure first approach that a lot of cloud providers around the industry are taking today. What that means is your data ends up with a malicious third party actor and you don't know the location of your data anymore. So essentially, if you're on a legacy cloud provider, what you're getting is not data location. It is a copy of data at a location of your choice with other copies floating around the world in laptops as you travel, mobile device notification servers, and malicious actors that exploit vulnerabilities. So really, the question to ask when you think about digital sovereignty is not just where is your data located, but more importantly, who has access to your data? The reason that matters is, if your data is located in one place but the whole world has access to it, it's no longer sovereign, no longer secure, no longer private. At Google Workspace, we're taking a completely novel, unique and differentiated approach to sovereignty. We're really thinking about digital sovereignty much more holistically than just rote location of data. We do that by starting you off with an extremely secure foundation. Google Workspace is cloud native and zero trust out of the box. What do I mean by that? I mean, we were born in the cloud. We are not migrating over from legacy infrastructure routes. What that allows us to do is ever since Workspace was started, we ensure we authorize and authenticate without implicitly trusting any workload that is serving your email, chat, meeting, document, or file software. It's zero trust built in, not bolted on. We were doing zero trust well before it was a cool thing, for decades on end. So you start off with that really secure foundation, and on top of that secure foundation, we offer a powerful set of digital sovereignty controls that we are calling sovereign controls for Google Workspace, which ensure that you are able to authoritatively answer that key question of who has access to your data. The other thing that we're doing with this set of sovereign controls is we're using the same key set of controls to comply with certifications for some of the most rigorous standards around the world. What that means is these set of controls help all our customers comply with various compliance regimes around the world, and the uniqueness lies in the fact that we have one single native platform. We do not have a segregated GovCloud or a legacy infrastructure. 
The benefit of which is huge because as and when we comply with one regulation and the most rigorous standards of it, all 10 million customers of Workspace naturally get that same level of rigor without having to actually do any other brand new installation, change management, or migration over to a segregated infrastructure. And these benefits, benefits really manifest themselves when you think about that secure foundation that I spoke about earlier. Because we're cloud native, we're browser first. What that means is you don't need a thick client to access Google Workspace. We're full functionality in the browser. Data ephemerally sits on your device. Once you're done working, you shut the browser down, the device is wiped clean. Think about how much that reduces the security risk vector for all of you, because even if the device is compromised, there's no data on it. Secondly, we offer a unique capability that I'm going to dive into where we place you as the sole owner of keys. And what that does is ensures that sensitive data is not readable by phone notification servers or by foreign governments or even by Google itself. And lastly, you get a ton of security goodness straight out of the box because of our zero trust roots and secure by design. And like I said, zero trust built in cloud infrastructure. The statistics speak for themselves. Comparatively, when you look at the CISA database, we have zero known exploited vulnerabilities over the past three odd years. That is a pretty impressive track record. All of you know how tough it is to hit a zero on security, and we're really proud of that. We're gonna continue working hard to do that. Speaking of hard work, a simple way in which all this work benefits many of our customers without them realizing is the notion of patching of vulnerabilities. When there's an industry-wide vulnerability, we do all the hard work to patch it ourselves, and we can do it on behalf of our customers because we're cloud native. What does that mean? It means 10 million workspace customers have never had to install a single patch for workspace over a decade. Think about it. What it translates to is workspace customers don't dread Tuesdays more than Mondays. It's a bit of an inside joke. If you know, you know. Now, on top of this secure foundation, we build out a powerful set of digital sovereignty controls that are across our three pillars of sovereignty. The first is data sovereignty. What data sovereignty means is you can keep all control over all residency and access to your data. We do this through data regions and client-side encryption. The second is operational sovereignty. What this means is you have complete visibility and control over cloud provider operations, meaning Google's operations on your data. We do this through three powerful access controls. And the third is software sovereignty. What software sovereignty does for you is you can work without a dependency on Google, even if Google is not able to serve you anymore because of a black swan event, in the rare occurrence of a black swan event. And we do that by placing a copy of your data in country that you own and that you can use for disaster recovery scenarios. It is these holistic set of controls that we're calling sovereign controls for Google Workspace I'm going to walk through each one of them one by one now, and we're really pleased to make feature announcements today across all of these controls that we're launching either live already or coming in preview shortly. Let's begin with data regions. With sovereign controls, you can regionalize your data. Data regions already allows our customers to store their data at rest in either the US or EU, the region of their choice. Today, we're extremely proud to announce 
that we're extending this capability to serve your Google Workspace applications and process your covered data in that same region of your choice. We're already live in alpha with a few customers, of some of them who you're going to hear from, and we're proud to announce that we'll be in public preview by the end of this year. And like you can see, you can do all of this with a few clicks on your administrative console without any scripting. We do all the hard work behind the scenes for you. And all of this is completely opaque to your end users. You don't need to go through the rigmaroles of data moves and migrations and such. It's business as usual for all of your end users and your entire workforce. Now, we recognize that there may be customers that have more granular leads around location beyond just the regions of US and EU. Today, we're proud to announce that we are going to go to preview by the end of the year with the in-country copy of data where you can move a copy of your workspace data into a Google Cloud storage bucket of your choice. You can host it in any of our regions, clusters, or mini clusters. What this does is brings you to parity with your legacy cloud provider right away because remember I said earlier, what you're getting with them is a copy of your data in your country. Now, we're going to go one level deeper with granularization. We're going to give you the ability to store your keys in an extremely granular way in a key management service provider of your choice. We're extremely proud today to announce a strategic key partnership with global security provider Talus and strategic key partnerships with StormShield and Flowcrypt. What these allow you to do is store your keys in a specific region of your choice with a trusted partner of your choice, and it gets you way more granular than a country because when you combine powerful capabilities like context-aware access of Google Workspace, which is a manifestation of our zero trust to our administrators, when you combine context-aware access with client-side encryption, you can set very powerful rules that localize you to the zip code level. Now, speaking of client-side encryption, remember I said the key question to answer for digital sovereignty is the notion of who has access to your data. We answer that question authoritatively with client-side encryption. This is a unique technology that Google Workspace is offering. We are placing our customers as the sole owner of keys. What that means is even Google or any foreign government has no access to your content. You become the arbiter and the decision maker of all access by deciding who you award the keys to. And we're doing all of this in a seamless way in which it doesn't impact end user collaboration. And to that end, I'm really proud to make a series of feature enhancement announcements today on client side encryption. The first is we are going to enable all of you and your end users to work on the go with sensitive data. We're doing that by bringing to general availability mobile applications for client-side encrypted Gmail, Calendar, and Meet. What this means is you can use native Google Workspace applications in order to communicate and collaborate with each other in a client-side encrypted manner. The second is we're enabling external access for guests to join your meetings in a client-side encrypted fashion. We recognize that you do business with several stakeholders, vendors, partners, customers of yours, and we want to make that interaction and communication seamless while being completely private. The third, and this one's my favorite, is we're going to enable the ability for all of your users to read, 
respond, and resolve comments in Google documents with client-side encryption turned on. Now, we recognize that this can be mind-bogglingly tough for a user. We recognize that the weakest link in your sovereignty and security posture is the end user sometimes. And it happens because you're working on the go, you're about to jump into that subway that's leaving its station, you're trying to get that email out as well. That is a moment when a user may not remember to turn on client-side encryption. So what we're bringing out in preview in a couple of months is the ability for administrators to turn on client-side encryption by default for select organizational units or groups of users that work on sensitive data all the time. What this means is you can set your teams to work in client-side encrypted mode from the get-go without having to go through the mental burden of remembering to do that. Lastly, we're also going to support other file types. Soon, you'll be able to view and edit Microsoft Excel files in preview. All these together round out our set of announcements around client-side encryption, which I want to reiterate gives you complete confidentiality over your content. This is as private as private gets. Furthermore, we're delivering on operational sovereignty through access controls. Access controls allow you to control and view and get complete visibility over cloud provider operations, which is Google support actions on your data whenever you re request Google support help. We start off with a solid base of access transparency, which gives you powerful reports around Google's access to your data. Whenever we access your data, we make it clear the reason why we've accessed it, and it's typically because of support, and we give you your support ticket number. With access management, you can limit that support to the right region, which could be the US or the EU coming in preview later this year. And with access approvals, you can completely accept or deny any support access requests to your data. Today, we're proud to announce enhancements to access approvals that allow you to revoke access that you may have provided inadvertently, as well as granular access controls that define the time of access with a five-day period as an example. All of this, like you can see, is done easily through our administrative control, through a few clicks with a seamless integration into our alert center. We're making huge strides in sovereignty innovation because we recognize the importance of these controls to all of you. We made a promise on the investments we were going to make into sovereign controls about a year and a half ago, and like you can see, We've been delivering and executing clinically against that promise with timely delivery and sometimes accelerated delivery of many features across the board that help you strengthen your sovereignty posture. Now, we're in the midst of a pretty profound shift to, in computing to generative AI. No talk at Google Cloud Next would be complete without speaking of generative AI. And what we wanted to do here is make a few commitments pretty clear to everybody. Your data is your data, and that stays true with Duet AI. The reason I say this is Google has been a pioneer in the space of artificial intelligence for many years on end. Workspace has been leveraging artificial intelligence to deliver a lot of customer goodness. We have Examples like document-generated summaries in docs, Smart Compose that helps you write emails, and grammar and spell check that has helped many users correct grammar in their Google documents. All AI-generated, all AI-driven features. We have millions of customers using them across the board for many years on end. They've been using these features in a highly secure, private and compliant manner, 
All these features are certified at the most rigorous levels of certification so far. Duet AI is no different. Duet AI continues to respect all of your trust boundaries, all of your security posture, sovereignty posture, and your privacy. Because like I've said, your data is your data. Our commitment stays true with Duet AI as well. In order to bring that to life, let me walk through the life of a query with Duet AI. <coughs> Duet AI resides within your data boundary, like you can see. And when the user issues a request or a prompt, we first use the user's documents and information to help provide context around the prompt. What this means is we look for the documents and the information that the user has the right access controls to. It respects all of the existing ACLs, all of your trust rules, and everything else when it pulls this information. This is how we contextualize and provide customization and personalization in Duet AI. That's why you see demos like the one we showed at our keynote with project symbol specifically serving up a deck that was extremely customized to pet food and Gen Z consumers. Duet AI does not use your customer data or prompts to train our models. What this means is you can essentially have your cake and eat it too. It's not a trade-off between privacy and providing helpful contextualization. And for all of the generated outputs, Duet AI completely respects all of your existing policies around data regions, around data leakage prevention or data loss prevention, and any other security controls that you have in, in place. Lastly, but most importantly, under no circumstances does Duet AI let any of your organization's information leak outside your trust boundary. All of this essentially means that you're getting a highly private, secure, and compliant experience to leverage the best in generative artificial intelligence through Duet AI and turbocharge your productivity. We're already working with several regulatory bodies around the world to bring the greatest and latest in certifications to Duet AI. With that, enough of me speaking about Google products as a Googler. Let me please join me in welcoming to stage three of our marquee customers. We have eminent speakers from all three of them. I'm going to make Mike, a quick okay. round of introductions. To my far right is Aspi Havewala, Exec Director at Verizon. Then I have Sean Bookham, Director at PwC. And Liz Del Negro, Associate CIO at the United States General Services Administration. Thank you very much for joining us today, making the time. Um, I'm sure the audience will benefit a lot from hearing rich perspectives from all of you on your respective journeys. Why don't we kick things off with uh, you know, telling us a little bit about the nature of your organization's business, what, maybe what a typical day looks like, and probably even a fun fact for the audience. Okay, I'll go first. Uh, hi, everyone. First of all, hope you're having a great next. Thank you for being here with us and spending this time. We really appreciate having you here. Um, so I work for Verizon Telecom. We build um, amazing networks, and then we hang a bunch of services off it. So if you're a consumer, you can use your cell phone on it. You can have fixed home wireless access as well, where you can actually run your home network off of 5G. Uh, we also build great experiences for businesses on those same networks as well. So for example, if you were at the event uh, last night, and I hope some of you were, we would typically um, set up 5G for those kind of events as well. So I work in the end user uh, computing and services and support space. So my day in the life is wake up in the morning, think about what we can do for the employees, and go to bed at night and think about what we can do for the employees. So obsessing about that experience is number one. And then um, I have lots of fun facts about myself that I probably shouldn't talk about, but maybe what we can talk about is when I was um, 
growing up, I really wanted to be one or two things. I wanted to either play cricket professionally, and if you don't know what cricket is, look it up, um, because it's a fun game, uh, or I wanted to be a comic book artist. Those were the two things I wanted to do, but then life gets in the way, and in my case, there was just a consummate lack of talent that got in the way. I just couldn't do it at the level that was needed, so here I am talking to you. I'm still pretty lucky. That's, that's pretty amazing, Aspi. <clears throat> A lot of unrealized dreams in cricket shared with you as well. <laughs> Hi, I'm Sean Bookham, UK Operations and Transformation Director, PwC. PwC is a leading professional services firm, been around for 170 years. Um, we have over 300,000 partners and staff, and we operate out of um, 152 countries. Um, my role is a bit of a Jekyll and Hyde role. So on the one side, operations, I um, try to optimize the the running of PwC, um, the productivity of PwC, and through the productivity, I have the collaboration role. So I'm responsible for Google Workspace across uh, the PwC network. Um, from a transformation perspective, I kind of try to disrupt um, the way of working for PwC. So find new ways of working, looking at new technologies, how's that's going to influence. Um, and as a bit of a side job, I, I also get involved in creating new delivery centers. So. In the last couple of years, I've had the privilege of working with a team to create a technology and innovation center in, in Cairo, in Egypt, and this year in South Africa. Um, like Aspie, I've got lots of um, fun facts or, or probably weird facts, but I'll, I'll leave a, a very weird one with you. I was once swallowed whole by a man-eating plant. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a tough one to top. Yeah, so that's a tough one for me, especially since my fun fact is I'm actually not fun, according to my husband and kids, at least. Um, so, but I'm Liz Del Negro. I am the Associate Chief Information Officer uh, at the General Services Administration. GSA is a federal government agency, and our agency is kind of behind the scenes. So we uh, run public buildings. We actually also have major uh, contracts, acquisition, we run fleet management, and we also do technology transformation. In my role, I um, run a kind of a, a suite of uh, enterprise tools, SaaS solutions, as well as I support all of our back office functions, so HR, finance, marketing, legal. Um, my day-to-day -day is really uh, filled with meetings. You know, we're constantly trying to deliver uh, for our, you know, GSA uh, programs. And, um, you know, I can go from business cases to, generally I'm always looking for funding, I'll be honest with you, um, <laughs> but to uh, continue the IT support. So, but my real fun fact actually is I do actually love cooking. And my favorite thing to do is to have people over, six or eight people, have dinner parties, I make them all sit around the dining table, um, and uh, I really enjoy that, so. Well, that's amazing, Liz. Uh, like I always say, some of our harshest judges are at home. <laughs> um, you know, I, and I think it's great that all of you have chosen Workspace to drive digital transformation across your respective organizations. Thank you for being longstanding customers of ours. Um, tell us a little bit about why you chose Workspace and how that's played out for you. Okay. Shall I go first? Okay. Um, so. PwC's had workspace for just over seven years. Um, we, we adopted it to fundamentally change the way in which our, our people worked. We wanted to make work easier. Um, probably like a lot of organizations, from a collaboration perspective, for many decades, we've been uh, a relatively closed um, organization. So we shared information on a need-to-know basis, and we, we figured if we could you know, harness that information, if we could unlock that information that was stored on hard drives and filing cabinets in people's heads, we could you know, better answer our, our customers' queries, we could innovate with greater agility and, and, and success and less duplication. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we, we've been doing that. The, the other thing, um, and you mentioned it in your, your intro, um, it was important for us to go with uh, an organization which had collaboration um, built from, from the ground um, and, and a cloud product you know, from the security and various other bits and pieces, but also from an innovation perspective. We felt that you could innovate more quickly um, it, with, with that sort of um, architecture. 
um, and we wanted to work with an organisation that was keen to develop quickly and that we could influence that um, development. And, and that's been working really well. So at GSA, um, we were actually an early adopter of Google. Um, we, in the 2010s, were looking to move to email, our email to the cloud. And we were the first federal agency to actually move our email to the cloud. And we were able really to adopt Google because of the security posture already. Um, so uh, I would say that um, Workspace has been uh, well adopted at GSA. and. During the pandemic, it played a huge role. Um, you know, we uh, really, I, I want to say it was March 20th, right? The next day, we were all working from home. GSA really is one of the few government agencies that I'm aware of that was seamlessly able to work from home. And the really interesting thing to me, you know, since Google is cloud native, we are you know, we were able to see functionality um, improve pretty quickly. I don't have that with other um, uh, SaaS solutions. Many of our solutions have a separate GovCloud, and so it can take a year for me to get functionality that's commercially available. But for um, during the pandemic, I mean, we saw Google Meet improve dramatically, really over, I would say, over six months. And that's because of the cloud native uh, um, architecture that it's running uh, and it was really it was great to see and it really actually made um, the you know experience of working from home a lot smoother that's fantastic Aspi uh, you know our um, we obsess about the employee experience so um, and we really believe that happy employees equals happy customers you got to keep your employees happy and it translates into have uh, really happy customers and by the way I forgot to mention this but if you are a customer of Verizon, if you happen to use it, thank you. Uh, we love having you on our network. And if you're not, um, consider giving us a chance and do something amazing for you. Um, but back to the question. So we've been very careful about building a digital landscape. It isn't just about one set of tools, but the, a set of tools that really are integrated partners who can co-create and work with us very closely and who can support us on the journey because as you might know, it's not enough to just deploy technology. You really have to help the employees and raise their digital dexterity over a period of time. Otherwise, nothing you deploy matters because nobody uses it to the full extent possible. So we very carefully crafted that journey. And we also were very cognizant of the fact that we really wanted modern tools, real-time collaboration at the table, uh, and really use the opportunity to show our users how to work differently. Because if we don't, then they become uncon they, they are not really as competitive as other employees in the market. And then as a company, you lose your edge over time. So that was very uh, top of mind for us. So real-time collaboration is super important. And those were some of the reasons why we made the choices we did and really built out that landscape that's fully integrated, co-creation with our partners, and really enables real-time collaboration for everyone. That's amazing. It's great to hear that we're driving digital cultural transformation across all of your uh, organizations. I think what's interesting is all of you come from a, a varied set of industry verticals and geographies, and it's great to see that diversity here. Uh, and we have, you know, the suite of sovereign controls. So tell us a little bit about, you know, how you implement your sovereignty and compliance posture with Google Workspace. Um, so um, digital sovereignty is actually not new. It's something we've been talking about for years. Um, in the US, uh, we do not have a, a GDPR like Europe does. We have r a multiple data protection acts. You've heard of HIPAA. In my case, I follow the um, uh, Federal Information Security Act, FISMA. And so our FISMA um, data protection was in place early on when we moved to uh, Google. So what Google has done for us, I mean, we have one cPanel, right, and we, we manage multiple domains, uh, and it makes it really uh, easy. I think uh, your comment about the workspace vulnerabilities, not having any in the last three years has been fantastic. I also would say we have not had an email breach um, uh, with workspace uh, at all, and I hope I'm not jinxing myself right now by saying that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I would say uh, my CISO, my Chief Information Security Officer, uh, does really appreciate uh, the security architecture around Google, and that just makes it uh, you know, a lot easier for us to administer. 
That's amazing. That's really warm feedback to hear, and we'll work really hard so that you're not jinxing yourself. Thank you. <laughs> you know, for us, um, the co-creation process has been really important with Google. So we, um, we, we worked on data regions together, and we were first movers on that. Uh, we worked on assured controls together. We were first movers on that as well. We work with a lot of um, public sector and private sector companies, and we also provide services to a, in the private, um, in the public sector space quite a bit as well. So for us, it's always really important to have that as the beginning of the journey and not at the end to think about those controls. Um, so we use all of them. And CSE has been really great for us too because we can add that additional layer of security where nobody can see the data, not even the Google uh, administrator. So it helps us meet a lot of export and compliance type of control requirements as well. But what's really cool about it is it's built on the same cloud, so we don't have to pivot to a different cloud. And it always bothered me as an employee experience person that if you were working deep in the compliance and regulated space, your experience was always a lot less better than the experience of a pure knowledge worker. Um, because you had to pivot to a different cloud and it was really tough. Uh, it was really tough to manage. Uh, what's nice about this is it's all on the same cloud, and we are now bringing the experience closer together. So it, you still have to care for a few more things than a general knowledge worker, but your experience is so much better, and that really gets me excited about um, having everything on one cloud as opposed to two different clouds. I love that. Love that it's not a harsh trade-off between compliance and innovation yeah. for you folks. Yeah. And um, PwC is very similar to, to ASPE. You know, we've been doing the diverse testings and other bit species. I guess what's slightly different from PwC, we've as I said earlier, we, we operate from 152 countries, so we have to comply with multiple sets of, of regulation. Um, often the regulations overlapping, it's com in conflict with each other, etc. So we needed um, sovereign tools and, and security tools which are very flexible, so we get that from, from, from Google. Um, in terms of what we use, we heavily use the regions, um, uh, like Gatsby, we, we use the assured controls. Uh, recently rolled out CSE for Gmail, it's working really well. Um, we've been testing the um, data processing in regions and we continue to work very closely with you guys in terms of your future developments and that roadmap. So it's, yeah, it's great. Thank you for being such a partner on this journey, such a great partner on this journey. Um, and I think, you, you know, like I said earlier, we're in the midst of a profound shift in computing uh, to generative AI. And like you know, we've made a lot of announcements around Duet AI for Google Workspace at, here at Cloud Next. I know that all three of you have been kicking the tires on Duet AI in your respective organizations. Uh, would love to hear a little bit about how that's going. What role do you see Duet AI playing at your respective organizations? Right, well, I love the question because we need to talk more about generative AI in this conference. I'm pretty sure everybody's gen AI'd out, but I'll try to answer the question in the most useful way possible. So we've been kicking the tires on a number of use cases around generative AI. In my space, which is employee experience, I see it kind of playing in two areas, right? Um, one is the creation of content, and that's probably the more popular, the more glitzy features that you've seen in terms of Help Me Write and other things uh, in many different products. I think that creation process is going to require a lot of learning and training from employees. The other area is going to be in, the, in, the, in this area of consuming information, because all of us, get overwhelmed by the amount of information coming at us. And Gen AI has a really big role to play in helping you consume information through transcripts and summaries and asking clever questions of the AI that will help you. Uh, for example, if you're out for two weeks and you've always had that email glut that you have to catch up on, uh, AI can help you there. And I think that's where I see a lot of promise in our organization is helping our employees make the best of consuming information, getting on top of what they need to know, and then also helping with the creation process as well. So that's what I'm most excited about. I love that framework of thinking about productivity as creation and consumption of thought and Duet AI helping drive both uh, better and, and making users more powerful on both vectors. Yeah. Sean. Um, uh, for those of you who saw Serge LaChapelle, it's a wonderful presentation yesterday. Serge talked about moments that matter in, in, in productivity. So he talked about steam, electricity, um, computerization, and now Gen AI. And when I kind of look back, I've been, next year I've been working for 40 years. And during that time, I've seen the introduction of the PC, I've seen the introduction of productivity tools, the spreadsheet, et cetera, um, email, um, collaboration more broadly, smartphones, and so forth. And each of those has, has helped us 
um, make step changes in terms of our ability to be more effective and so forth. And Gen I is just going to take us, is, is another moment that matters that's going to be um, in, incredibly exciting. As we sit here today, we, we know where some of those formative steps are going to take us, and Aspie's referred to some of those. Um, we saw some insights in, in the keynotes in terms of where it's going to take us next. But truth be told, we don't know ultimately where it will take us. Um, so, and that, that's the really exciting thing. Um, if I look from a security standpoint, um, and you mentioned it earlier, one of our, our weakest links in security is the human being, because as human beings, we make mistakes. So I, I can see an important role for Gen AI in helping automate some of those mundane tasks that are mundane but important from a security processor to make sure we make fewer mistakes. Um, but yeah, I can't wait. It's going to be great. That's great to hear. Liz? So in my case, um, we you know, got a peek at Duet AI a couple months ago, and I immediately saw the value. Um, I am in meetings all day, and those meetings are pretty diverse. I could cover really a number of diverse topics. We have diverse customers. And you know, we'll be on uh, Google Meet and have a really rich conversation. Um, but by the time, sometimes you you know, from Google Meet to actually get it, getting it into the written word, it's not, it's not always um, the best result. So I saw the value right away. I could see um, the ease of just even creating an email from those um, from those uh, meetings. So. We uh, started looking at Duet AI, and of course, you know, when um, Gen AI uh, was really, you know, it exploded, um, GSA locked down all the tools, um, as most government agencies did. Uh, and you know, you probably have all seen the congressional hearings. That was a big deal. That actually started us down the policy route. Um, but I happened to be in a meeting with Ganesh, actually, where he was explaining the security and how our data is going to be kept within GSA's domain. And I really knew in an instant that I would not have an issue getting this approved to move forward. And that's exactly what happened. By us having the control, again, and the visibility of where it is, um, that you know, my CISO it was a no-brainer for him, which is not an easy thing for me to say. Sorry, I shouldn't be hitting my mic. But um, so that, I mean, that's really exciting. So we are actually uh, putting a group of testers together. And I think we just have to jump through a few more hoops, but we're ready, getting ready to uh, test it out. So really looking forward to it. Absolutely. I mean, really exciting times if you look at computing right now. And I think what we can do to really transform the way people work and really empower them. And of course, we're doing it all in an extremely thoughtful and responsible way around privacy and security and sovereignty of all of your data. That stays true all the time. I just realized that we're at the hours mark. Uh, I did want to say a huge thank you to all of our customer panelists today. Hopefully, all of you benefited from the rich perspectives and points of view that they've all shared. A huge thank you to all of our audience. I know many of you have traveled here from everywhere in the US. We hope you enjoy the rest of Cloud Next and safe travels back home, whether it's a short journey or a long one. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.